All righty. So uh, hi, everybody. Good morning or afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, thanks so much for joining uh, for Liquid Margins 45, AI and the Future of Learning, Trends, Challenges, and Opportunities. Uh, we're super excited to have you all here, uh, especially following up on our Liquid Margins episode about a year ago, just as AI really started to make it to the forefront of technology, and especially in the classroom with a lot of the things we're hearing about students these days. So we thought it would be a great time to bring back some of our panelists uh, to talk about what we've learned over the last 12 months and how we see AI in the classroom and the future of learning. Uh, before we dive into that, just a couple things uh, for housekeeping. Uh, first, if you have a question, we would love to hear it. Uh, we have utilized the Q&A section, and that's available in the bottom of your navigation bar. Uh, so the panelists and I will be answering your questions and uh, responding to others' questions. Just make sure you drop it in there as opposed to chat, which might be something that you're used to. Um, secondly, if you want to see transcripts or closed captioning, uh, you can simply enable that via the closed caption icon in your Zoom menu that should be located at the bottom of the screen. And um, you know, we're back in the swing of things this year. So we've got Liquid Margins 46 coming in just a few weeks. Uh, and that'll focus on boosting grades, retention, and engagement using social annotation. Uh, that'll be on Tuesday, March 5th. So you want to make sure you can register for that as well. But uh, I'm super excited to be here. I'm Joe Ferraro. I lead the commercial teams here at Hypothesis. And um, we had an amazing session last year. So we wanted to bring back three uh, really amazing panelists. Uh, first, I want to welcome Dr. Nick Lalordo from uh, the University of Oklahoma. Then we've got Rachel Rigolino from SUNY New Paltz and Joel Glad from the College of Western Idaho. So, hey, everybody, thanks so much for joining us again today. Um, so I thought, you know, really rather than uh, driving the conversation, let's just dive in. I mean, it's been about a year since we all got together and AI in the classroom was pretty nascent. I mean, I think it was sometime around Thanksgiving in 2022 when chat GPT really became a four letter word for a lot of schools with a few more letters than that. And uh, people have been trying to figure out what's the best way to adapt and are students going to use it? And what is sort of the utility purpose of this? But we had a lot of predictions then. Um, what have we seen since we all last got together? I'm trying well, to remember I'm, what our predictions were. Yeah, I, I, I'm just <laughs> going to jump in really quickly to say that my, my big thing was I, I offered a winter session course in AI applications um, in primarily education and business. And it was probably the best course I've ever taken. It, it taught uh, in a while, and it was filled with future teachers who experimented with um, generative AI programs, and it was a blast. So that's my big update. That's amazing. And so what were some of the things that you learned from that course? I learned that the actually, you know, uh, there's been a lot of resistance on the student end of it. And once I told them that it was okay, that we were going to have fun with this, uh, there was a lot of creativity, you know, using um, image generation along with um, text generation. But then there's that reflective part about it, right? So where you reflect on what you've done and how you did it and how the tools worked. And it was really just so much fun. And so you said the students had some resistance to using it. Were they afraid they'd get in trouble or? I, and they still are scolding me. I mean, this semester, I they look at me and it's like, tsk, tsk, what are you doing? And I, you know, AI, I'll talk about later, is kind of like my teaching assistant. And they're kind of just still disapproving. I, I don't hear that as often as I hear the other way that students are leaning really heavily on AI. So you had a good cohort. Yeah, that's interesting. I I, um, I do see that, and that's something I can speak to later as well, that there has been, uh, it's um, an interesting dynamic. So like, you know, when I think one of my predictions is that it's going um, it, to, it's going to, uh, AI is going gonna, is gonna to roll out in kind of a dialectical fashion in, in throughout higher education, meaning it's not going to be just like, okay, here's the future of higher ed and we're all going to like eventually adopt in this way. I think there's going to be a variety of like, you know, um, uh, various forms of resistance and alternative um, teaching in response to this. 
And I do see that in some students. I, um, you know, since last year, I think as students become more familiar with the tools, they're learning uh, on their own, but also through through others that, you know, uh, the AI can be dangerous, these tools can interfere with learning, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they come into the classroom with, um, you know, preconceptions about whether or not they should or shouldn't use AI. So something that we've, that, um, and, and I don't, like, I, I, I want to make sure that one of the things that I continue to do is provide a space for uh, a range of responses to um, tools like JGPT and not assume, and, you know, that, that, okay, we all need to approach it in this way. Because um, I realize it's still, it's still so new. So since, so one, one, you know, one, one solution or one, one response to this, and I think one of my big updates over the past year has been to work on a, a training for, for students that's tailored towards um, <clears throat> the students, that, the kinds of students that I, that I teach in my institution. Uh, and, and also, you know, uh, keeping in mind the, the, their familiar, their familiarity with, or, or lack of familiarity with these tools. And so uh, along with Liza Long, another, uh, another faculty member, uh, faculty member at my institution, we, we, we developed um, an AI training. I can link to that in the chat. Um, we have two versions of this and we developed this over the summer and, and have been trying to update it. Um, I don't, how would I, where, where would I drop this? Is it, oh yeah, chat, just put it in the chat. Okay. So this is the OER and then this Perfect. is the H5, H5P. Uh, the H5P is more is more recently updated, um, and so one of the things we're trying to do here is uh, not assume that faculty and uh, or students have familiarity with the tools. And so if 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 I want to roll these out, or if I want to teach with them in any fashion, um, students need to know the architecture, like how they operate, um, and then just basics like what is what is an input. Um, like, where do you, what does it mean to input something? Uh, what is a prompt? Uh, what is a context window? Um, all these things, um, very savvy users of ChatGPT understand, but if you start to teach with these tools, you quickly find out there's wide disparities um, and, and, and the level of knowledge. So the training, um, and then from there, um, uh, figuring out, you know, the, the right of classes that I teach, um, what the use cases are because it's been different in each in each type of class writing courses literature courses and first year experience courses this is the main categories i teach and i've had to figure out where ai fits into each of those roles so i can stop there i've been talking a lot um i can say more but i'm gonna i'm gonna pause for now let me jump in then because i have some some similar experience maybe with some differences uh and i teach in a small kind of i call it almost a boutique freshman writing program so first year students writing primarily about literature, you know, and the broader, more traditional definition of that term. And from that perspective, what I'm, I've been working with and struggling with is how to think about chat GPT as, as a humanist, which is to say, if I put on another hat and if I'm doing writing across the curriculum work, I'm with business community or construction engineering or whatever, that they're interested in output, they're interested in writing that solves particular tasks. And that's a very different perspective than let's say a first year writing course where we're thinking about writing from uh, the, the building of student identity, civic identity, personal identity, all of that, you know, perhaps corny, but fundamentally really important stuff. And so in a way I have to almost have individual and I have the privilege to be able to talk individually uh, to students, you know, in the context of, of required one-on-one -on -one, uh, essay revision conferences. And so what I found myself doing a lot over the past year is persuading a student that, that for this particular assignment, let's say a manifesto representing the particular perspective of a group uh, from your generation in the context of a writing seminar entitled Generation Gaps, uh, why would you want to use a robot to speak for the particular problems that your, let's say, affinity group, that your peers, the members of your identity are facing? You can tell a robot, as we all know now, to role play that, and it'll produce something polished and more or less hollow sounding, depending on how good a prompter you are. But why would you want to do that? So I think 
a lot of these one-on-one -on -one conversations have helped students think about the extent to which writing is a workplace tool and the extent to which it's more of an, you know, an exploratory uh, tool that, that humans use you know, to cultivate being human. And so when you explain that to students, how do they, how do they take it? Because I mean, that's actually a question I've thought of. Why would I ask a robot what real people would think? I think partly students ask a robot because of the transition from high school to university, because of trends in, in high school level pedagogy that often involve writing about set passages, extracts from texts in very mechanistic skills oriented ways. So that I, I don't think the high school curriculum, you know, as I see it through the refracted perspective of what my freshmen tell me, you know, and the literature I, I look at, I don't think the high school curriculum actually necessarily positions freshmen to come into university and trust an instructor who's going to ask them to write in an exploratory reflective fashion I, and i think building that trust is something that one has to work on hopefully in institutional circumstances you know that make it plausible okay and so i think if i'm hearing you when you're asking students to write that's something people deem a bit more personal than maybe some of the other examples we see for AI. I think we saw the headlines last year, student chat GPT is crushing it when it comes to the bar exams or to the SATs or to even science exams compared to the average, but that's not helping students really learn what they need to learn, is that right? No, I think, I think that's right. And even before chat GPT, I would give an example of grading, you know, a thousand AP English exams and learning many facts about poetic form, structure, et cetera. But none of those thousand essays gave me as a reader a reason to read them. And very few of those essays expressed anything one could call a, a sense of a, of a motive compelling that student to write. So yes, I, I think ultimately, and this is, I'm going to stop here because I'm I'm certainly transitioning into a different a different conversation, um, but maybe the relationship between process and product is sort of what's what's looming here, and allowing students to, to trust writing process more, in the context of an educational system that maybe hasn't been emphasizing that so much. Okay, and I know we've got a question from uh, the audience that says, you know, does AI actually impact student ideas for creativity, originality, and authenticity? I mean, if you're reading a thousand essays about the same topic and I don't have a compelling reason to read, I guess we know what the answer is going to be. Authenticity is a word that, that in my experience, first year students use and understand. It's a key term for them. And it intersects with discourses like the whole conversation about influencers. So there's a notion of writing authentically, and there's also a notion that that you can fake that or you can perform that authenticity very compellingly. So I mean, it's a fraught, it's a fraught topic. Um, if Chat GPT is asked to impersonate a particular subject position, or if other LL LLMs are asked to do it, you know, one can produce plausible results. But I also think that if if you pose that that option to students, that does strike them as wrong still on a fundamental level. And I, th I think and I think that's a worthwhile intuition, you know, to work with. Yeah, that's something that um, I think one of my if if I I think if I predicted last year that. Let me lower my hand. That uh, students would increasingly be using these tools to do the work. I have seen an, uh, a slight percentage of increase in, in that happening. Um, students are as students become familiar with ChatGPT, uh, Gemini, Quad, less so, but the, they understand it's out there. As they become aware of these things, I think it's showing up in Snapchat now as well. Like it's everywhere. LLMs are plugged into like uh, every conceivable you know uh, web app that that students are using. 
there's a slight uptick in how much they're using it to complete their work, but it's not as much as I expected. And I'm seeing students eager to learn, you know, I, maybe I, I shouldn't have been, uh, I should not have been so cynical, but uh, I can tell like in online courses and, and face-to-face uh, modalities that students do want to learn. They do want to preserve their creativity and, and voice, and they're trying to figure it out. Like, how do I use these tools that are so exciting and I'm getting such good results while also um, learning how to think for myself, right? So it's, it, this is not, you know, this is not a zero sum uh, game. And I, I don't think that has to be the proposal here. And so something like an AI ban, I think does see it, see it as zero sum um, in the learning process. And I, I don't think that's the case. And I think our students are finding out that's not the case, right? However, we are getting research <clears throat> uh, results on um, what kinds of implementation can foster learning and then can interfere with learning. And so this is something I'm trying to, I'm trying to be aware of and trying to stay up on. Um, I saw a study the other day that, that showed uh, the impact of AI-assisted peer feedback in a writing course um, and uh, the impact that, that different kinds of you know, uh, assistance had on whether, what, um, whether or not students were more capable later on in the course in doing the same operation. And what they showed, what the study shows is that uh, if students were given, were, were given too much AI assistance early on when introducing new concepts related to peer feedback, they actually perform uh, worse um, uh, even though, sorry, even though that they, even though they gave high quality feedback or feedback that was actually rated as very high by their by their peers later on, when the when that assistance went away, their feedback was rated uh, more poorly than the students who received less assistance or no assistance. Meaning, it seems like um, uh, it, it, it seems like students, if they receive assistance. Uh, too much assistance early on when practicing new skills and habits, um, it might actually, you know, might, and this is probably intuitive, but it, it can interfere with learning something, right? And so one strategy here is just simply to make sure that students um, are forced to uh, make choices when it matters. And then, uh, and then we can see AI assistance is coming later to reinforce certain choices or students understand what choices need to be made and they can evaluate and scrutinize generated results based on something they've already learned. That can be one option. But, but the instructor can also just needs to determine in each course, what choices do I really care about and do I want to see and evaluate um, or sorry, see and assess versus what choices uh, are are more tangential or less important and i'm fine if they're outsourced to a machine and i think students need to need to get you know need to figure this out and i think i mean faculty like we do this or a number of faculty i know and including myself we we know ourselves like these are the choices i want to make throughout the day these are the choices i don't care about and i'm perfectly com comfortable outsourcing that to a machine right Yeah, we have quite a few comments that say, you know, the first level of concern is that AI is become a, going to become a substitute for the reading. Um, I mean, Rick's comment says his institution actually says to use AI to make sense of long pages and other documents as opposed to doing the reading. And I think, what do you all think of that, actually? You're the experts. I don't think anything. Okay, well, so really quickly to say, and I shared this with my students, I've got a plug in, I forget what the name of it is. Um, it summarizes, you know, articles that I'm reading. And I tell my students that indeed, I use it constantly. And it, it, it the bullet points then let me know whether I'm actually going to delve into something is there's almost acting like an abstract, right? And then we segue into talking about scholarly journal articles and reading that abstract. Um, and I see very little difference with that, but I think in terms of, it, it is our fear, right? That that instead of actually doing the reading, that students will just type in a prompt. But I mean, that also has been around before ChatGPT, you know, um, the typing things into to Google just to get some kind of standard response on a, a study site. So I'd be interested to to know what other people are thinking about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have a similar 
take on on that in the sense that the production of summaries that may be something that that you can you can outsource um to uh an llm um but again then you have to at some point the summaries themselves have to be evaluated uh and they enter into a conversation right they enter into the you know the scholarly conversation and so at, at some point still read, reading has to happen and you know this is this is certainly one place where the positive benefits of, of web annotation might start start to emerge and i know we're going to get there but so i guess i guess what i would say is I, I might ask students i have asked students to use an llm to translate a paragraph of a historical source into more contemporary language and then i'll have students in groups look at that translated uh version try to make an argument about what what nuances of meaning or what what syntactical uh you know complexity doesn't get translated so not not doing the reading is always going to be a problem but i think I think that LLMs are only one factor pushing in that direction. Uh, Rachel, you you alluded to this. I, I, I if I remember, um, you know, there was the long term conversation about uh, cell phone technology and you know curricular developments. There are a lot of different forces uh, making students less capable uh, at reading extended, complex prose of any kind. So I, this is, um, I, I can speak to this uh, in one of my courses, I can try to be specific here. And actually this fits into, uh, this is hypothesis who's hosting this. And I use I used hypothesis to help um, with this question about um, how much we should trust, you know, even things like bullet points and summaries from that are, that are AI generated. And so uh, in fall of 2023, um, I built a number of AI <clears throat> um, assignments, or yeah, assignments that involved using AI um, into throughout the course, and some of them used you know mixed blended uh, social annotation, others just you know discussion forums and that kind of stuff. Um, in some cases, we uh, I would like I, this was asynchronous, so it's hard to like you know improvise on, on the fly. Um, but it, but this goes to show this can be done asynchronously, right? So in some cases, I would have a conversation with ChatGPT. It was GP, GPT four, um, uh, the 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 paid for paid for model. Um, I would have the conversation and ask her number, ask her, try to get it to do something that was for the course, and uh, I would kind of force the model to hallucinate, right? To kind of like you know generate generate results that weren't that weren't uh, present. Um, in, in the context. And so in some cases, like I was asking, I think I, I asked it to provide key quotes uh, that compare, you know, Gothic elements from, from uh, two of uh, Edgar Allan Poe's short stories. So I would upload the stories and I'll say, hey, can you identify Gothic elements? Okay, now can you provide key quotes? Now can you turn this into a, a no, now can you read this scholarly article? Can you explain how the scholarly article can help make an argument about Gothic elements in these two stories? Now can you outline an essay? Now can you draft the essay? So kind of like similar process as the student would, but using the uh, using the machine, right? And then I would, um, I would, so I would force the hallucination because I knew as soon as I asked it to provide key quotes um, uh, from the post stories, it was gonna, it was gonna mess up something. And it, and I think like sixty percent of the quotes were were hallucinated. Um, of course, now it's getting better. That that's less likely to happen. Uh, but you still, it's still pretty frequent, and it's something to look out for. Um, uh, and then, and then. Um, I gave them the, I used hypothesis. Um, I, I fed it the, uh, this was embedded within, within our, our, our uh, LMS. And so I, I, I fed it the conversation. Um, and I had students comment on the ChatGPT, on my conversation with ChatGPT with the, with the question, you know, what are the limitations of using this tool um, to help complete this research-based assignment that we're supposed to be completing, be completing by the end of the semester. And I wanted them to look for uh, 
um, limitations due to the architecture of ChatGPT. So for example, like look for hallucination, look for um, uh, um, uh, bias, look for um, uh, lack of, uh, uh, you know, original thinking or lack of voice. What does that mean? Can you, put, can you put your finger on exactly what that means? And so they have a discussion with the conversation in order to figure this stuff out, right? And so in response to one of the questions I'm seeing in the chat here, like, can it foster critical thinking? I'm like, well, this is an example of where I think it does, where I think it, it did. Having a conversation with the machine can be highly productive depending on how it's implemented. Yeah, so I'm really impressed, Joel, with what you're doing there, taking it to a whole other level. The most I do is bring it in, we'll, we'll punch it in, and I'll have them look at it stylistically. And getting back to our earlier point about authenticity, um, I think that's going to be the coin of the realm, right? That whoever, yeah, that students don't like or they say they don't like inauthentic things, right? Um, and it's going to be, yeah, who can bring that personal touch? But going and going back to the reading, and I, I'm just going to put this out there that I have done away completely with discussion board at this point. Um, I got tired in the but what is it now we're in the fall. last spring just occasionally just getting things that have been generated clearly by chat gpt and and i just moved completely to social annotation and it's just been so much better to just ditch discussion board but that's my little yeah yeah so um and i also noticed one that one of the comments in the chat about students like, you know, quote unquote, cheating a lot to help with reading, um, just kind of skimming through, you know, instead of reading the stuff, just kind of asking for summaries. And I think this was in a lit course. And I will say that again, when I used hypothesis uh, in the LMS, um, I found that students like really did engage with the primary text more than they otherwise would have. I, you know, I think just, I mean, it's kind of a simple, um, design tweak, right? I mean, if if they need to be very specific and highly annotate, like you know, a string of text, and someone else is responding to that annotation, they're less likely to outsource that, right? Uh, it just, I mean, it's a more it's a more engaging way to in, instead of hey, read this and then go to the discussion board and write a paragraph. That's very very easy to just copy paste into ChatGPT. Yeah, it makes a sense. It enables the sense that authors are real, you know, that, that authors have have conversations across history about about issues and that you can have a conversation in the margins of this of this text. And and I think when it's working well in that sense, uh, hypothesis gives me in the classroom or gives us in the classroom, you know, something like like the best of both worlds, you know, some of the, the passion of those free will and conversations that can happen in the classroom, but at the same time offering a gravitational force that keeps those conversations from, from digressing or at least keeps returning them to the text eventually. Of course, not, you know, not every set of annotations um, is going to be successful in the way I describe it, but I do think the way it, it helps teach writing as a kind of ongoing historical conversation. You know, this is the famous metaphor from, from Kenneth Burke of the cocktail party that, that all sort of rhetoric and composition people know, the unending conversation about ideas, which is of course, the, in some respect, you know, an, uh, an idealized and, and problematic fantasy. But again, a hypothesis, even the writing in the margins help students identify themselves as, as writers like this writer they are reading. It helps you talk about the authors of the texts. They don't, they don't say things like it. <laughs> Excuse me, I knew this would happen. They don't say things like, you know, it says there in the book. They realize that they're arguing with, with authors, you know, with human beings. And I think, I think, that's uh, another, you know, related uh, benefit of, of hypothesis and web annotation. And so have you all had to really adjust your, how you're assigning annotations in the wake of AI or, 
I agree with the discussion board piece that you mentioned a few minutes ago, Rachel. Like, I feel like if you scroll through most discussion boards, every student's just agreeing with what the student before said. And if you're feeding a prompt that's hallucinating quotes, the whole class is now agreeing on things that never happened. And so it's finding different ways to actually get these students to engage. Did you have to change your prompts at all when you started to think about annotations, knowing that they could sort of talk to the machine? I did not, you know, I really haven't changed um, too much. I, I always try to be somewhat creative, though. I, I have them, they, for example, very easy thing, you know, share um, at least in every discussion of whatever uh, short piece of fiction we're looking at, uh, share a related resource. And it can be a video, it can be this or that, or the other thing. And that just kind of livens it up from the beginning. Um, I think also in terms of annotations, keeping them because I have a, you know, a class of 25, I keep them in groups of um, five or six. So they kind of get to know each other. And I think, you know, over the course of a couple of modules, they really become a group. And then I, I do shift the groups around. But I think that it just leads to and I getting back to this idea of a real conversation that it, you know, but discussion board in the beginning seemed like it was promising that it could possibly be a real conversation. I think then we all realized about, you know, 10 years in or five years in, it wasn't going to. And this does capture it. It, you know, you just tweak it a little bit. As I say, I find smaller groups rather than this big all class group, for example fosters that sense of community, for example. Yeah, I have had to change um, so the, so I guess let me speak to like how I changed some assignments. Yeah, I've already explained how I use social annotation to help think critically about generative generative AI. But then also separately in separate assignments where, where student, I'm asking students to use these tools. And, uh, and when I ask, by the way, I do allow students to opt out and complete an alternative assessment. Um, it, it, maybe that, that might change at some, at some point in the future, but right now I realize there's still like a heter heterogeneity of responses to this. And um, I wouldn't allow for some students to just say, hey, not for me, you know, I ethically do not want to use these tools. Uh, you know, we, I don't ask them to opt out of like, you know, using the internet. Uh, obviously they can't complete their class, you know, without doing that. Um, but for now, I think it's okay for me to allow students to opt out. And it, I think I get one out of a section, uh, you know, maybe maybe one student a semester opts out. Um, anyways, so uh, in these situations where students are asked to use uh, ChatGPT or another AI tool to, um, to experience, uh, to, to practice, an outcome in the course. I do try to use that, you know, I try to keep in mind, uh, um, um, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna interfere with students learning and I don't wanna interfere with student agency. And so one, the way I tried to do this is uh, I asked them to first attempt something by themselves, usually uh, to demonstrate like proficiency, proficiency or familiar, familiarity with the content, or if it's a literature course, I want them to be able to summarize the text themselves. And, and you could say, well, you know, students might go ahead and cheat um, and just generate, you know, the, the summary uh, when they, when th that, that's supposed to be theirs. But I, I think most of the time students actually want to learn here. And if they know they're going to be generating the summary next from the machine, uh, they're not going to see the point. They understand, oh, hey, it matters. The, the instructor really does value my thinking at this stage in the process. So I'm actually gonna to try to read the text and summarize. And then knowing that I can generate a summary next. I think when we make it explicit and not just kind of pretend that students are not using the tools behind the scenes, uh, then we might actually foster more, more thinking in this way. So I ask students to do it unassisted, uh, try this out. And then I ask them to get AI assistance in some fashion. And then there's a reflective piece um, afterwards like hey how did you uh you know did you notice any limitations in the in the generative um uh, generated results uh you know keeping them on the training that we did um did you learn anything and i think this is kind of one of the more interesting responses like hey you had to do this by yourself then you used ai afterwards to practice the same outcome 
um, was that productive? Would you have been better off had you not had you not experimented with AI at all? And in most of the time, students uh, feel like they're becoming more competent with the with the course outcomes by using generative AI, which is a really interesting result, right? Um, and then finally, uh, the reflection. So that's part of the reflections. And then I ask students to respond to their classmates' experiments, and I find this to be cr critical. Uh, to the success of these assignments, because especially in, in, in online environments where you can't just have conversations about this, right? So I asked students to respond to their classmates because some students who found, you know, biases or hallucinations or just severe limitations, like, oh, this tool was was garbage, didn't work at all. Other students kind of point out like, hey, I think you, you know, maybe try this next time and you'll get a different result, right? So it's kind of interesting to see students coach each other on how to use the tools. I'll just add briefly then, I have not yet required uh, you know, student use of chat GPT or any other LLM. Uh, I have done some workshops in class with other tools. Some of the um, alt alternative uh, database, uh, programs that are being developed, uh, research rabbit, things like that I've experimented with in, in the classroom. Um, I think requiring AI at this stage requires either, you know, an institutional uh, insurance of equity so that I know all the students are using the same platform with the same capabilities and the privacy is is being covered, you know, and that would answer one set of questions. But I mean, there's an even bigger set of questions having to do with 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 labor exploitation, uh, with environmental impact, and you know, knowing uh, as I do the concerns of of university freshmen, I, I'm not an insignificant number of them also feel strongly about about those issues, right? So, I actually do intend to require extensive use um, of of LLMs this fall. Uh, since I'm 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 going to you know teach teach a new seminar uh, on writing as a technology, and I'll devote a substantial section of the course to Chat GPT. But then the students will know what they're getting into in advance, and they'll be you know self self selected. Well, I mean, there's always a scheduling, but but some of them will be there because of my of my course theme. Yeah, even I in my winter session course that was entitled AI Applications, <laughs> I did not require. Um, I think everyone but one person wound up for their final project um, using an LLM. Um, they created picture books for children. They were, you know, future educators K through K through 12, most of them uh, for younger children. And that was a lot of fun. But I did, I exactly, I did not require it because there were students that don't want any of their information and put it into an LLM. So, and that was fine. And they were able to do an alternate assignment, uh, create a bibliography for me. Um, and that worked just as well for that one student. And I think we've had a couple of questions about the ethics and what are the alternatives. And so I think it's great that those have been shared, but, I guess we've got Greg's note now, especially in the tech and science fields, we're hearing from industry partners that if students don't know how to use these tools, they're not going to find jobs. So how do you how do you bridge that gap, especially with idealistic freshmen? Well, I just bring it, I'm very I I do a lot of I teach a lot of business students. So I I'm just very upfront about it. And we read, um, you know, articles about, but then we get into, um, for example, I've had, you know, I do, I use a lot of like case studies. I are used to, I used to, here, I'll back up a little bit. I used to buy a little package from uh, HBC, uh, Harvard Business School. Now with ChatGPT, I can create fictional case studies. And I tell them that I've used ChatGPT to create these great case studies about um, generative AI, much less, I'm not even touching the other AI when you're inputting you know, uh, client data and you're coming up with who gets the loan and who doesn't. 
but these case studies as a way to talk about ethical uses of gender, because they're going to have to know how to do this, right? And not to put input client data, for example, um, and, and to be aware of all these issues that are out there. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a no brainer, uh, especially, especially in some, you know, applied sciences and business. You know, I, I think the question about uh, how to, it might be easier for someone like Rachel to, to make that connection because of the types of courses that, that she's teaching. For me, a lot of my courses um, that I teach are going to be, you know, first year, first year writing, first year experience, uh, <clears throat> literature, um, and, and, um, and so these students, like I'm, I'm, you know, this is like I'm, I'm just covering the foundations and a lot of these things. And, and I wouldn't say it's a harder sell, but I'm not. This is a, there's less focus on like uh, content expertise when it comes to the workforce. And so it's, it's, it's going to be more difficult for me to show like, hey, here's a, here's some, some studies out there that show how AI is impacting business, um, uh, th this particular industry or whatever. I, I can't do that, and sometimes I, sometimes I do, but it's not a major focus. Um, I think it's something I I I should. Um, I think it's something. So, I, like, I oversee the first year experience program at my institution. That's like part of my new role here, and we have rolled out uh, AI training. I shared that that H five P module to you, students. Uh, all students who take our first year experience course have to complete that training um, during their first semester at our institution. And so they do have this foundation, but I think part of uh, this program should cover at some point, um, like, hey, you, you know, investigate how these tools are used in a, a field that interests you, right? And do something around this, right? That should be part of the exploration here, because I think this is so, uh, it's still so new. There's still, it's, there's a lot of moving pieces and, you know, how, how students use these tools in their field um, and, and, you know, a few years or several years is going to be very different from how we currently use them. That's, I mean, I suspect that's going to be the case, right? And so really it's a matter of um, understanding how to work with AI in ways that we haven't worked with machines in the past. I think that's like the bigger, the bigger thing. Um, and I think faculty who, there's a lot of things that we do throughout the day. And I think I mentioned this before, Part of, like we also are an industry. Part of our job is figuring out how we need to value our time. And some things like, you know, updating an FPAR or something like that for a job don't require our original voice. It just needs to be done, right? And we can, you know, there are ways to like uh, be productive um, and be better at our job using these tools and there are ways to use them poorly, right? So we're figuring this out ourselves. This is also true for us. I, I just want to say one thing very quickly, too. I forgot about my education students. Right, exactly. This is, they're going to have to know all about uh, generative AI. So again, with, with creating personalized things, but you're right, creating, I hate to say this, but creating a rubric, right? Let AI do it. I mean, yeah. We've we've come a little way from the the, the last question, but I, but one thing that seems worth adding here is, um, I I had occasion to look at our general education uh, student learning outcomes, you know, here here at OU, um, and think about how one might respond to uh, the rise of generative AI, but in the context of a list of of these outcomes. And so if I read off six categories, I won't go into huge detail here, but communication skills, technology and information literacy, critical analysis and scientific reasoning, uh, quantitative and numerical analysis, community, culture and diversity, arts and humanities. I mean, you can already see that AI has an impact in all of those areas and can be approached from all of those perspectives. And, and in the case of a writing class, um, I think it's not so much that AI has to be approached in any one way, but that whenever one poses, let's say, 
relatively complicated social questions. You know, we mm -hmm. might say a university level of, of complexity, right? Whenever one poses those sorts of questions, you know, in the in the near future, right now, you're going to find that AI related debates are, are popping up almost immediately. I mean, it just seems to me that it's going to be, become part of any general education curriculum, increasingly central, because AI is kind of almost uh, the nexus um, AI issues, the, the relationship between between specialization and some kind of general human knowledge. I mean, is that that whole problem is getting reconfigured very quickly by AI, it seems to me. I had a conversation with an instructor last week that primarily teaches first year students. And they said one of their biggest challenges is most first year students are used to traditional learning. They're coming out of taking notes in notebooks and reading paper textbooks. And they're getting to the university level where suddenly they have a lot of OER, they have a lot of online resources, and now they have chat GPT that can help them make a few shortcuts. And they sort of actually conflated it to autopilot on a test line. You still need to have a driver's license, even if it's going to avoid the accident on the road in front of you. I mean, what do you see with students that came in this year, if you're working with first year students and how they look at this, maybe as opposed to the students who stopped brand new last year? That's that's a fascinating question. Ooh. So part of, part of the complication for me is that a lot of our um, increasingly a lot of our gen ed courses are offered as dual credit, right? And a lot of dual credit students take them. Uh, so increasingly, there's kind of this overlap between high school and college, depending on the high school. But you're right that there are a lot of disparities in what kind of high school experience students have and i think i noticed that in my own classrooms where depending on their background they're either they're either very tech savvy and the onboarding experience needs to be needs to take that into account right so for if, if if you know one of our our, our uh, principles is is inclusion or did and it's something we care about uh, a lot or we've been talking about a lot recently is digital equity to me this is part of that part of that piece is like we can't just assume um you know, if we if we want to roll out AI assistance in some of our some of our courses, we can't assume that our students are are um, that there's one kind of digital native, right? We can't make that assumption, um, and we need to make sure that we have a whole infrastructure that that provides an onboarding experience uh, for the reasons that you mentioned, right? I think changes in in student attitudes toward toward technology are so mediated by the pandemic you know and the way that the young people who who then were in college then were in high school at the height of the pandemic are now you know coming into universities the way they developed new forms of, of 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 being social with one another new, new forms of communication even you know kind of, i think new new affects or something i'm not going to start breaking out into into philosophical uh um speculative rant here or anything but uh the digital native that the, they see the world differently i don't find it that that phrase or that metaphor gives me any reliable information in terms of what skills they're going to have or or not have i think that that's very that, that's quite various as i think you you were suggesting joel um that that competence can vary widely um but i also say that in terms of using hypothesis um you know, as a way of of sort of thinking about and, and mediating technology developments, there's a there's a, a corny professor trick I, I've I've been doing where I find a particular web page. It's probably about a decade old now, and it talks about the value of print texts and and annotation for for retentive reading. Um, and I I jump in there and I I, I put a, a affectionately snarky hypothesis comment on it, um, showing the 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 new the rise of the new digital annotation technologies, and that that has led to fun conversations in the past because students themselves I think are genuinely unsure about 
screen reading versus print reading and what kind of skills and abilities uh, are necessary when, when moving from one to the other. And, and I would um, just thinking about my first year students, I teach a high flex course. High flex means that students can take my course asynchronously. They can be in the classroom or they can be um, virtual and port themselves in, you know, during my class time. And what's amazing to me, these are first year students, how many of them just want to be in the classroom. And there's this pushback, you know, I was looking at that, the, the video a few days ago for the people burning the autonomous vehicle in San Francisco. And it's kind of a metaphor for, I think, a lot of our students, and Nick pointed to a lot of these intersections, right? And, and they're environmentally conscious, a lot of them. And I mean, thinking about these bigger issues, I think they're maybe coming out of that high school you know, pandemic, and they would have been what? Where they've been ninth grade? I forget what grade they would have been, but they experienced it. And there's pushback on a lot of this, which I think is is healthy, actually. Um, so skepticism, AI skeptic, yeah. Yeah, the, I, among faculty and students, the rollout of this technology seems to spark um, emotions unlike any other tool or technology that I've seen roll out in higher ed. And so as like, um, so my current role, I've been having more discussions with, you know, operations and other people about, you know, what kinds of infrastructure, what what does infrastructure support at our institution look like? And I've seen in the, in the, in the Q&A that some people, you know, have access to co-pilot, uh, their institution has turned that tool on. Um, and, and for us, I think part of what we're trying to do is making sure that there's like the we have um, we have the voices of various stakeholders, and we're we're there's kind of a feedback loop to where we're kind of like we 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 hear and understand the different um, kinds of voices and concerns around this, and that that there are no surprises, there's, and there's no like boom, here's the technology, everyone has to use this. Uh, and this, and this is all the, you know, the, and faculty members will face this in their classrooms as well. Like the, how they roll this out, if they choose to, it does need to take into account the kind of resistance that, that Rachel and, and Nick are, are noticing. Cause I see it too. It's, it's, it's a little bit uneven and, uh, I know I can't predict. That's one of the things that's hard for me to predict is whether or not, whether or not that'll just remain just, uh, one or two students a semester, or if there's going, if it's, or if it could be uh, highly politicized, which might be a possibility. And I think we should be prepared, prepared for that. That should be part of the conversation. I know we we all saw Arizona State in the news with their partnership with OpenAI a few weeks ago, and you know, co copilots live on so many campuses. I, I think one thing that you mentioned, Nick, is you talked about just learning outcomes. You know, it's not just technology. You have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to do so many other things to actually make it through a curriculum. And there is no silver bullet. Chat GPT is not going to solve it all for us. And so it's finding ways to really enhance the other pieces of the learning journey for the students. Um, I know we're running up on time. So I guess... We made predictions last year, and I'm sure we'll make predictions this year and see where they turn out. But if we were to bring this group back together in 12 months, what do you think would be different? And I'll start with you, Rachel, because you're at my top left. Okay, so I think that you you brought up Copilot. It's going to be ubiquitous, um, but but so that's my prediction that you know obviously within five to ten years we won't you you won't even be offering a course like AI applications. It'd be like you know, spell check applications. But by the same token, I'm wondering with that political division, there's going to, I think there's going to be a, a growing, or maybe not growing, but a steady group of people pushing back continually for various reasons um, about the kind of just embracing um, generative AI. Um, I think there's going to be like a, a definite, you know, little group of rebels there. All right. And what about you, Nick? I I think I I agree with 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 Rachel's prediction prediction, and I, but I'm I'm going to offer a, another one that's you know not not in contradiction, but I guess in, independent. I think we're going to finally see a real 
change in this long argument about about the decline of of reading uh, among among young people. I think uh, I think the explosion of generative AI and this long term cultural shift away from reading extended or, or, or complex prose texts is likely to to really produce some meaningful change at, at the university level. And I think, you know, we as a culture don't decide anything. So I don't want to use that kind of a rhetoric. But but I do think that uh, the reading of, of longer texts um, is is becoming a skill that is very much a specialized skill. And the movement uh, of of the maybe just the acceleration, the production of more and more kinds of task specific writing, uh, I think mean that the even the the humanities curriculum is is going to have to adjust to just a fundamentally different sense of of why people read things. So that's that's a pretty a pretty bold and also vague prediction, but maybe you'll be able to call me on it in a year. Yeah. Uh, somebody <laughs> called it degenerative AI, and that. Ah, I like it. I like it. I, I, if if you ask if you ask the AI, you wouldn't get anything quite that witty. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, and Joel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, similar to the others, I think uh, uh, Microsoft the Copilot options. You know, Microsoft schools, Google schools. Uh, these will be. These will continue to be adopted to ensure, um, I think, privacy and, and, and equity is going to be a big piece. Digital equity, uh, equity um, uh, that's that's going to become bigger and bigger because um, we're just making us, you know, so we're not making assumptions about about uh, faculty and, and students around this. Right. Um, it, but I agree with that, Rachel, that we're going to see uh, like unexpected kinds of resistance to this. Um, and I'm curious, that's kind of a question for me, what that looks like. And this could be, again, this could be like a political battle. It depends, right? This could be if, if it only takes a few people to point out some things for this to be highly politicized. And um, so like, that could happen. I, I hope it doesn't, but it could be. Um, and then I think, uh, I think there's going to be a big split in, um, in, a, in um, how faculty redesign the courses around AI. I think those who, uh, those institutions that are high, highly reliant on online enrollment will probably have more rigorous expectations around their faculty designing for AI in the next year. I think we're going to see much more trainings in those institutions, whereas other institutions that a significant enrollment is in person um, will probably double down on the importance of these in-person modalities. And I think I'm seeing that in my institution. We're trying to figure that piece out is they're, 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 we're seeing, uh, we're revaluing the importance of in-person modalities, and yet faculty and students are preferring online more and more because it's so convenient. And I think what the evolution of AI in higher ed is going to revolve around those exigencies, right? So uh, nothing, nothing like terribly interesting there. I think, um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> It's, it's definitely an interesting time in education. I mean, four years ago, it was less than 20% of students were taking any online courses. And within six weeks, almost the whole country was. And it wasn't easy to teach faculty how to teach online or students to get there. And we're just constantly learning new things. And so um, I'm excited to have you all back next year so we can see if we were right. And so um, just as we wrap up, um, you know, we do actually have a really great resource for our current partners, and that's Hypothesis Academy. Uh, and we have a social annotation in the age of AI, which our next cohort will be launching on March 5th. So if this is something that you're looking to really focus on, uh, it's a great opportunity to learn from other faculty. And if you're just getting started with social annotation, we've got our general so social annotation 101 uh, in mid-April. We're going to be sending all this information with the recording after this call. And this is for all current Hypothesis customers. Uh, if you're not a customer yet, we do have a great promotion for customers who sign up before the end of the spring semester. It gives you discounted pricing, also does give you opportunity to join our workshops and our Hypothesis Academy just starting in a few weeks. And again, don't forget, we've got our next Liquid Margins, number 46, on Tuesday, March 5th, uh, that focuses on boosting grades, retention, and engagement with social annotation. 
so Rachel, Nick, Joel, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your busy schedules to chat with all of us. I know we didn't get to all the questions in the Q&A, but I think everybody learned a lot and uh, can't wait to do it again next year. Oh, it was a pleasure. It was fun. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Take care.